The next part of my trip takes me just to the south of the National Park, about 12 miles east of Balach. A steep path leads to a viewpoint above Stocky Muir. This is the Queen's view. My path leads around Ochen Eden Hill to a bizarre rock feature in its northwestern side. As I rounded the grassy hillside, a huge rocky outcrop just seemed to rise up from nowhere. I had reached the Hwangi. A couple of well-worn paths lead up to gaps in the rock. I would walk this path from the other side. The boulders that were piled up to my right had obviously sheared and had collapsed from the main hillside when this strange event occurred. About a hundred metres from the entrance to the canyon, the path veers around to the left and a gap appeared just above, so I headed up. At first it looks as if it's a dead end, then a gap appears to the right. Again it looks like a dead end ahead, but it heads in a little deeper. Another gap appears to the right, then through an even narrower gap a well-worn path leads down and further through. The ten metre high walls on each side look as if they've been sheared from each other by some unnatural event in the past and were eased apart slightly. The path eased through another gap and dropped slightly. It was a little wider here and I continued down. The outer wall was about 10 foot thick for its full length and about 100 metres long. A whang is Scottish for a long narrow strip of land and slang for a large piece or slice so it's not all that strange to see where the name originated from. As the ice retreats it can pull the rock that is frozen to it from the hill. I made my way back to the entrance. The Hwangi is about 300 metres high at this point. As I made my way around the rocks at the outer side, Conic Hill could be made out over to the north. I carried on around the hillside as the path curved underneath the outcrop of fallen rocks. This is an excellent short walk to a strange atmospheric landscape which ends up leaving you with more questions than answers. On the other side of Strathblain, we find a most attractive whisky distillery, Glengoyne. The main road in front of it defines the Highland line, so the whisky is distilled in the Highlands, and across the road, the whisky casks are matured in the Lowlands. It started operating legally in 1833 as Burnfoot Distillery, but as elsewhere in the area, the farm owners here at Burnfoot Farm were illicitly distilling whisky for generations. I arrived at the village of Drimmon. It used to be a popular stopover for the ancient Highland drovers. It's now a short detour for the many hikers using the West Highland Way, which passes the east end of the village. The Clachan Inn is one of the oldest inns in Scotland. It was licensed in 1734, but I'm quite sure it was selling the water of life long before then. That would be the main reason why the village was so popular with the cattle drovers. At one time it was managed by Mistress Gow, a sister of the outlaw, Rob Roy MacGregor. The first village we come to in the eastern shore of Loch Lomond is Balmaha. A great way to discover the village is to head to the info board at the back of the huge car park at the National Park's flagship visitor centre and take the Balmaha Millennium Forest Path. The path that immediately turns left and down through the dense tree cover behind the car park. I was accompanied by the musical sound of the woodland birds. The path now heads down to cross the only road through the village. The path then heads right to a viewing platform at the edge of the sprawling Balmaha boatyard. Passengers were disembarking from the Inch Callier ferry when I arrived. A little dead end road runs along the loch side to the old pier with backward views over the boatyard. My path leads off to the right where a very good step section leads uphill to another wooded stretch to the summit of Craigie Fort. As the path continues relentlessly uphill, there's a break in the tree cover, giving views over the island of Inchcalliach. The little ferry was bringing tourists back over from the island. I decided to head on along the Millennium Path. 
another break in the tree cover gave wonderful views to the north and to the island of Inchfad. I headed on up the steep winding gravel path. The views up the loch to the north were breathtaking. I was approaching the summit of Craigie Fort. The view from here is quite superb and covers quite a few of the loch's islands, with lusts just visible in the far bank. And it's not unusual to see deer grazing on them. They can often be seen swimming from the mainland to the islands at dawn or as a gloaming sets in. I continued down through the trees on a steep winding gravel track to open out onto the sheltered tree fringed sandy shores of the loch. The bay here is protected to the west by the wooded island of Inchcalia. Bamaha is a very popular lochside tourist spot. It's on the route of the West Highland Way and the sandy beach here is like a magnet to young families. The walk along the Millennium Path is an excellent way to discover the hidden delights of Balmaha and winds past two or three tree fringed sandy coves before reaching an elegant steel footbridge over a small rocky inlet on its way back into the village. And to add a sense of adventure, the rest of the path is cut out along a rough rocky ledge above the loch. As I looked back, I noticed a little lochside pleasure cruiser approaching from the north, rounding the island of Inchfad on its way from Luss. Ahead was past Foot Cottage, where the only road north swings round to the left. In bygone days, the cottage was an 18th century toll house. Just beyond the boatyard, I arrived at Weir's Rest, with a wonderful life-size statue of the well-loved climber and TV presenter, Tom Weir, complete with Tammy, hidden by a woolly red one when I was there. Weir's Rest is now an excellent picnic spot, and a small mountain garden has been added to complete the project. Just beyond the garden is a picturesque oak tree inn. No visit to Balmaha is complete without stopping there. Roberta loved her trips to Balmaha, and a coffee at the oak tree inn was a perfect end to a perfect day. I took the road north along the east bank of the loch to River Denon at the end of the road. River Denon is merely a hamlet at the end of the road. A few houses and a nice hotel, but that's it. There are nice walks by the loch side, and there's always something to catch your attention. I noticed a couple of paddle boarders out in the middle of the loch. As I made my way around the loch side, I noticed another paddle border just offshore. This is where the loch starts to narrow, and Tarbit appears ahead, as do the mountains to the north of it. The huge peak of Benvorlich dominated the scene. At the head of the little bay is Rower Denon Lodge, the most beautiful youth hostel sitting at the foot of the Tarmigan Ridge, and looming above has been Lomond. This was actually a quite busy wee corner with a beautiful secluded little beach tucked into a rocky tree fringed cove, and the tourists were making good use of it. A hiker paused to rest their weary legs and take in the views for a while. There is a wonderful war memorial here. A plinth beside it reads, This land, rising from the shore of the loch to the summit of Ben Lomond, was dedicated in 1996 as the Ben Lomond National Memorial Park to be held in perpetuity as a tribute to those who gave their lives in the service of their country. The views up the loch from this spot are breathtaking. Tarbot, dominated by the wonderful backdrop of Achrois, Ben Vane, and further north, Ben Vorlich. A six mile drive from Balmaha is worth it just to appreciate this poignant memorial in the most wonderful of settings. <laughs>